Okay, chapter 10 is rotational dynamics. We finished rotational kinematics in the previous chapter. So we're going to do the analogy of forces here. And that analogy is the word torque. So a torque is to a turning object what a force is to a linearly moving object. And we're going to talk about its effect on rotational motion and what the analogy is for mass in order to do that. Um, <clears throat> And we're going to have a rotating body moving through space and do an analysis of its motion. So here's a picture of a long exposure of some stars as they're coming out. As you can tell, the Earth is spinning, is a rotating object. Um, but as we're spinning, we actually wobble, kind of like a top, every... 26,000 years, I think it is. So 5,000 years ago, um, Polaris wasn't the North Star. There was a different North Star, and there's been several. <clears throat> but the, all of that angular momentum has been around since the solar system formed. It wasn't like somebody gave us a kick. <coughs> the individual speeds change, but the momentum is conserved. So we'll take a peek at that. So here's a, a wrench. Yeah, you've got an axis of rotation at the center of the bolt, and you've got a force on the handle. There's a force um, that's center pointed, which doesn't really do anything in this case. And then there's a force which is tangential. This FB here is does create some torque. So FC creates no torque. As you know, if you try to turn a bolt <laughs> by pushing towards the center, nothing happens. Turning from this point A here, is very difficult to do. It requires a great deal more force to get the same amount of torque. So the torque has something to do with the direction that it's applied. I'm sorry, the position that it's applied and the the angle that it's applied, which is the direction that it's applied. So even though if those forces are equal in magnitude, they have different torques applied. So here are some torques in on some randomly shaped object object in some random on some random positions of it, right? Some of them would like to move the object, but if the object is on a fixed pivot, it can only spin. So it's got um, one way to go. So the line of action of a force is the line along which the vector, the force vector lies. So here, this force vector is here. It's exerted at this point. It's pointed in this direction, but you can make a line of that vector everywhere. And where that line intersects a line perpendicularly from the, the axis of spin um, is important to the feature. We call that the lever arm, the moment arm. Um, well, that's not the entire thing, sorry. Um, L there is the lever arm. It's the perpendicular, it's the, it's the line from the center of rotation perpendicular and to the, the line of action. Um, all that vocabulary is not terribly useful in the end. Um, there's a story about there about why I don't have my PhD in physics, if you want to ask me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so the torque is applied about um, zero. It has to do with that lever arm and the force itself. Those two things together. The length of the lever arm um, and the magnitude of F tell you something about the torque on the object. The direction of the torque is found by a right-hand rule. So you put your hand in the direction of R, the, the, the vector between the center of rotation to where the force is applied. You curl your fingers in the direction of the force, and your thumb points in the direction of the torque. So again, you either have clockwise or counterclockwise torque, like we did clockwise and counterclockwise um, angular acceleration and angular velocity and angular displacement. So we're just adding another vector like we did um, in directional space, but notice again it's perpendicular to both R and F. So there's a bunch of formulas here. That Greek letter tau here stands for the torque. So an individual torque is the force times the lever arm, um, or R times F times the sine of theta, or the sine of phi, sine of the angle between R and F. Notice the lever arm L is also R sine theta or sine phi. Phi is the angle between R and F. Super important to remember that. So F is a tangential, the force, the 
component of the force that is tangent to R, that is 90 degrees to R. All four of those things say the same thing. If you want to talk about it in vector terms, in terms of um, I hats, J hats, and K hats, um, the torque is R cross F. I find that much easier to think about once you actually have the cross product idea down. It's useful in a 12 to 13 different types of physics problems, and it's easier to think about all those details just come out of R cross F. It's RF sine phi, the angle between them. So here we've got this 900 Newton force pressing straight down, someone stepping straight down on the thing, and the angle between the horizontal and this wrench, this is a pipe wrench here, is 19 degrees, but the angle between um, the force and R, here's R here, is actually 71 degrees, is that other angle. What do you call that? The, um, I can't remember. <laughs> it begins with the letter C. <laughs> oh well. Um, geometry terms don't matter too much. Um, so here's a practice problem. You've got a three meter rod that's pivoted on the left end and a force of six newtons is applied perpendicular to the rod at a distance of 1.2 meters from the pivot causing a counterclockwise torque. Um, we're going to call that a positive torque. Counterclockwise is positive for us. A force of 5.2 newtons is applied three meters from the pivot um, and at an angle of 30 degrees to the rod, causing a, causing a clockwise torque, a negative torque. So find the net torque about the pivot. So here we've got this rigidly held body. They've tied a string to it and are pulling the string with a force of 9 newtons, causing this disc to spin. Um, there is... A force on the um, pivot, the, the, the thing, if you think of it as sitting on like a, a steel rod, it sits on there and that causes a normal force. Also the object has a, a weight pulling down on it. Notice that the weight mg and the normal force um, don't cause any torques <clears throat> because in each case r is zero and r times f times the sine of theta, if r is zero, you get zero there. So this is the only one creating any torque. However, if it is if it is not spinning, then the um, then the sum of the torques equals zero. Here it, it is spinning because there's only one torque, so it must be spinning. So it's starting to accelerate, right? Um, or it's been accelerating. Now the sum of the forces must add up to zero. The reason I know that is because its center of mass is not moving. There is no translational motion to go with it because it's fixed. So n plus mg plus this f over here must add up to zero. Um, so the sum of the forces in the x is zero because there's no translational x acceleration. The sum of the forces in the y is zero because there's no y acceleration. And the sum of the torques is not zero. I can see that from looking at the problem. So it is going to have an angular acceleration, if nothing else at the moment. All right, um, so our analogy for Newton's second law is the sum of the torques equals I times alpha. Um, I is the moment of inertia, and alpha is your angular acceleration. So that's pretty important. So now we're going to do some of the forces in the X, some of the forces in the Y, and then some of the torques, which you'll notice are in the Z direction, either positive or negative for all of those. Give you a linear acceleration in the X, Y, or an angular in the Z. There it is again, write that in big letters somewhere, though that is a direct translation. Um, make sure somewhere in your notebook you have theta is about x, omega is a velocity, right? Alpha and a, i and m, um, t and, and tau and f are all related to each other, are all part of this analogy together. So when you draw free body diagrams now, um, we've always been making them little points and that's been handy. But now that we have this R involved, now that we have an extent, sometimes we're going to have to make those free body diagrams um, with some radius, right? To where the maybe the outermost force is applied so that we can figure out what the torques are as well. So the sum of the forces on the cylinder here, if it's tied through a rod here, is probably zero. These three probably add up to zero. <clears throat> it does have a torque though, causing it to spin. And this thing, the sum of these two forces doesn't equal zero. If it did, it wouldn't spin. So it is moving downward. 
It turns out there's a relationship between, between how fast the disk spins and how fast the object moves downward. If you remember, I think it was from the last chapter, your, um, the linear acceleration equals r alpha. Um, the tangential velocity is r uh, omega. Um, and your linear displacement of the block down delta x is equal to r delta theta of the spinning piece. As long as... <clears throat> as long as the rope doesn't slip. Another thing I wanted to point out here is that um, the torque, sorry, the tension here and the tension here are equal to each other because there's nothing in between them. But if we had a second block thrown over the top of this thing, um, now that the pulley isn't massless, that disc becomes a pulley, um, those tensions are no longer equal to each other. If they were always automatically equal to each other, the disc could never spin. Right? It's only when, as that goes down to massless, as that approaches massless, that the, the two torques can be the same and it will still spin. That's a little odd, I know. All right. So here's this body that's being thrown through in the air. It, you'll notice it traces a parabola, it traces a projectile motion, just as before. All of the projectile motion stuff we learned is true, but the thing is actually spinning, right? Um, it spins about its center of mass. <clears throat> its center of mass um, does not spin as the object spins. If there are no, once you get it spinning, if there are no more torques on it, it continues to spin always about its center of mass. And it's the center of mass of the object that um, sketches out this parabola that it makes. So you can put the two together. It's rotational motion and its translational motion are together, but, the transla but they're kind of separate at the same time. The translational motion is all about the center of mass. Whatever, it's, if, as if it were a point mass, you know what its x and y um, coordinates are going to do from our study of kinematics, translational kinematics. And then what's it going to do rotationally? You can put these two ideas together. They are separate from each other, but you, they are um, a superposition principle still, right? <clears throat> and now we have a new kinetic energy. We had the translational kinetic energy was one half mv squared, and now the rotational kinetic energy, one half um, i omega squared. Notice here that there is no relationship between um, the velocity of the center of mass and the velocity of, or and the angular velocity of the spinning object. It can be spinning really fast through this, or it can be spinning very slowly through that same arc, right? That was only for um, <clears throat> when there was some connection between the, the outer edge of the spinning object and the, the path, like there was a rope tied to it or it was touching, or a wheel touching the ground. <clears throat> so now we had a bunch of potential energies before. We had springs and gravity and um, what else do we have? There are more, <laughs> more potential energies. Um, can be stored in a bunch of different places. But now we have a bunch of kinetic energies. Or, well, two, anyway. Rotational and translational. So here's an object. Um, a fan. And it has a moment of inertia, which they give you, and a net torque on it. And it starts from rest. And then it is spinning a certain amount after a certain amount of time. So what's its kinetic energy? Should be a pretty easy one. So now, if we have the rolling without slipping, then there is a relationship between the the velocity of the not the center of mass of the object, the velocity of the edge of the object, and how much it moves, which um, can translate into <coughs> the velocity of the center of mass, because the the center of mass is going to move the same distance that the wheel itself does, right? So if you like painted the bottom of the tire, it would after every revolution it would give you 2 pi r distance traveled, right? And your center of mass is going to travel that distance along with the tire, right? The center of mass is right above the place where the paint is being left behind. So now there's a relationship between the velocity of the center of mass and omega, and now you can make, <clears throat> if you're desperate, one equation out of them so that you can solve for their kinetic energy in one way. It's not particularly pretty looking, but if those are the only numbers you have, you basically have a, a, a new equation to connect the two, so you, they become one variable or an extra variable and an extra equation, depending on how you want to think about it. So keep that handy. There it is again. Alright, so this is Newton's second law, the external forces on an object. 
gave you the mass um, equal was equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of its center of mass. That's a linear acceleration. <clears throat> Same thing with the torques. The sum of the torques will give you I alpha, the external ones, right? <laughs> so they're pointing this out to you so that you can try to solve these rather difficult problems. This one looks simple. You're just grabbing an object and pulling upward on it, right? Um, the torques, uh, sorry, the tension here gives a torque, but the weight of the object does not because R is zero, right? This R is capital R, but the rate, the distance between the center of rotation and where the center of mass is because gravity is applied at the center of mass, that distance is zero. So you get no torque from that. So um, they don't equal each other. T doesn't equal mg. It looks like the object is going down. mg is bigger, right? So it'll have an acceleration down. It'll also have an angular acceleration. Um, and the energy is not conserved here because the person is pulling upward on the object. And so um, they're adding energy to the system, right? So there's, there's an outside force adding energy to it. If you knew what that, I guess you know what that force is. You could do an F times D, I guess, right? The distance um, pulled up, uh, iffy there. I don't think they would ask you that in this case. No worries. So you've got a rotate. You've got rotational stuff, and you've got translational stuff, right? Um, there is a connection as long as the rope doesn't slip between the angular acceleration and the linear acceleration. That's where you're going to solve. You're going to put the two ideas together. Now they're not going to ask an energy thing here, but you are going to be able to figure out exactly what's going on by connecting the linear acceleration and the radial acceleration. The sum of the forces in the y um, equal ma, the sum of the torques equal i alpha, and then alpha and a are related to each other. The acceleration is r alpha. All right, so similar thing going on here, a rolling object. Um, there's a normal force and weight, which um, affects its linear acceleration, but not its angular acceleration because there's no... Um, torques from those two. However, the friction causing the ball to roll does give it a torque and what makes it turn. So as long as the ball doesn't slip, you can relate the linear acceleration and right here and the angular acceleration, right? As long as it doesn't slip. And solve for a bunch of things in this problem. Remember, they're going to try to trick you. The force of static friction does not equal mu times the normal force. It's less than or equal to mu times the normal force. So instead, friction here... Um, hmm. Yeah, you're gonna have to figure it out. It's not an easy, not a jump to thing. Leave it as F, little f, for the force of friction, and then solve it.